Raise your hand if you have ever fired a gun. I'm talking a real gun now, not a BB gun, not a pellet gun, not an airsoft, a real gun. Okay, thank you. Raise your hand if you are a gun owner. Pretty close to the national average, I would say. Okay. Now, raise your hand if you have ever had someone that you knew die from a firearm injury. Doesn't have to be first degree relative. Someone is in your life, but not in your life. It's a lot. Thank you. Now, you notice my hand was raised for questions one and three. I wasn't just a gesture, I was actually raising my hand. Um, and there's a story, and here's the story. I have fired a firearm exactly 10 times. It was a 12 gauge shotgun. I was 13 years old, maybe, and I was with my friend Steve, whose father was a big gun enthusiast. And uh, Steve called me up, do you want to go to the, to the range, or whatever you call it? And uh, I asked my mom, who incredibly said yes, I could go, and I didn't ask my dad. But um, so the way this works, if you've never done it, has anybody ever shot like the clay pigeons? You know what that's like? Okay, so there's a big concrete box, and you stand there. I'm 13 years old, I'm scrawny with this 12 gauge shotgun, and you yell pull, and it goes straight, either goes left, right, or center, and you don't know. Again, I'm a little guy, 12 gauge shotgun is a big piece of equipment. And so I, you know, I bring it up, say, pull, and it comes out. And Steve's father, who was our, said, just cover it with the muzzle and pull the trigger. So that's what I did. I covered it with the muzzle, I pulled the trigger, the thing just shattered. First one, Steve's father was aghast. Of course, I missed the next nine. And my shoulder was sore for about two weeks, but that was my experience. So 10 years later, so I was like 12, 13 years old. 10 years later, I'm 22, 23. I'm in medical school, my mother calls. Steve's father is dead. This was also my orthodontist, by the way. Friendly guy, the kind of guy who would do impressions and paint the stuff on your nose and all that stuff. Steve's father developed a brain tumor. It was not a cancer, it was a tumor. Life altering, but not life threatening. It changed his sleep patterns and so forth. Steve's father got very depressed over this, took a handgun out of his desk drawer, in the office where Steve and I used to play, actually, although we never discovered the gun, and killed himself. So committed suicide with a gun. So now fast forward a few more years. You know, little did I know, my mother called me when I was a second year medical student and actually end up taking care of patients with firearm injuries. So um, I'm a surgeon, and um, surgeons are not known for public speaking ability. I'll just say that. Most of our patients are asleep when we talk to them. So, <laughs> and. Um, I actually have, I, during the break, I actually met the parents of three of my patients out there. So if you want to know what I like, if you want to know about bedside manner, I can have them raise their hands. But anyway, so I'm going to tell you a story about this kid. His, we'll just call him Joey. Joey was playing up in the bedroom with another kid. This was not obviously a dangerous situation, okay? Parents weren't home. There was a babysitter. Kids are running around. They're playing hide and seek. What kids do, I'm sure I've done it a million times. But in this household, there happened to be a handgun, it happened to be loaded, and it happened to be in the bedroom, it happened to be in the closet, and one of the kids was hiding in the closet, and he found the gun. And he took the gun and, quote unquote, playing with it, which I'm sure is all he meant to do, he shot Joey in the chest. So, babysitter recognized that, called 911, knew what to do, EMS comes. Meanwhile, I'm at the hospital minding my own business, I happen to be on call that day, as I am about 35 or 36 times in a year which comes out to 10 years of being on call, that's a year in the hospital. Ask my wife about that, she may give an opinion. At any rate, so, but you know, and we still carry beepers, I actually have it with me, I know these are old fashioned now, but a beeper says GSW 10 minutes. That means the kid is gonna be there in 10 minutes. Drop whatever you're doing, get your run down to the emergency room and get ready for what might not be a big deal, but might be a disaster, you, you never exactly know. I mean, BB guns also say GSW, so anyway, so we're down there and he comes in and he does not look well. Now I have to say, it's not like Hollywood. It's not like blood everywhere. Typically it's just a tiny little hole, maybe a little drop of blood. Most of the blood is inside. So this Joey comes in, he has what we say in the business as waning signs of life. I mean, he doesn't look good. The nurse takes a blood pressure and she says, I can't get a blood pressure. Well, nurses take a lot of blood pressures. They're usually right. If there's no blood pressure, the patient's not doing well. They put IVs in, they put the breathing tube in, you can sort of see at the top, and uh, the bullet hole is in the chest. We put in the chest tube, you can see it on the left, blood comes out, we put one in the right, blood pressure comes back, we've relieved some of the, of the bleeding, we're giving him fluids, we're giving him blood, we rush up to the operating room. 
He's bleeding from his chest. What do you have to do? We have to cut open his chest. You make the incision in the fifth intercostal space and you put in a spreader and you crank it open and you try to figure out where the blood's coming from. And th this may sound fairly clinical and fairly cold, but I promise you, we're not thinking that this is Joey a kid. We're not thinking that this is someone's kid. It's much easier to do this if you're thinking that this is just an anatomy lesson. If you're thinking about it as a kid, you might struggle because I'm gonna have to take out part of Joey's lung. And sometimes the relationship is even a little bit adversarial. Because it's like, kid, why are you bleeding so much? Why are you trying to die? We're all trying to save you. And it turns out, it's, it's tough to see in this picture, but he's like right in the middle of the heart, right where the spines are lying. I trust you guys know a little bit of anatomy. You see a little white density, and that's the bullet that was in Joey's heart that killed him. So now Joey's dead. And now you have to go talk to the family. And that's kind of when it gets real again. And so here I am, you know, my shoes, I'm soaked in blood, and you got to do sort of the long walk. You got to figure out, I got to talk to this family, and I'm going to ruin their lives. Their day is never going to be the same. And it's hard. We had one kid, it was actually an employee's kid, it was a long time ago. This happened on Christmas Eve. One kid shot the other kid in the face on Christmas Eve. It's like, I've ruined their Christmases forever, you know, so. So anyways, I went and talked to the family. You never know what to say. I mean, the families don't always know when they come in. I mean, the families hope for the best, usually don't expect the worst. Um, so is Joey's death an accident? I mean, how many accidents have I taken care of the last 20 years? I would say Joey's death is not an accident. I would say this is a disease. What's a disease? A disease is a condition that alters the normal functioning of the mind or the body. Certainly alter Joey's functioning, right? He stopped functioning altogether. Pediatric firearm trauma is a disease, okay? Anybody ever heard of childhood cancer? Anybody ever done a fundraiser for childhood cancer? For every kid who dies from childhood cancer, two kids die from this, two to one. Anybody ever been to a fundraiser for pediatric firearm trauma? Probably not. Now, if you look at disease, sort of the disease model, like take something like infectious disease. What causes Zika virus? A mosquito. What causes pediatric firearm trauma? Firearms. Handguns, specifically, but firearms. We know what the vector is. It's the handgun. We have a big problem with firearms in this country. We have a really big problem. This graph shows firearms for 100 inhabitants down on the bottom and firearm homicides going up that way. In the United States, we are a standout country. Sound like a politician. We are a great, you know, make America great. Well, we're great in firearm deaths, right? We are fantastic. We are way above everybody else. Everybody else in the modern Western civilized world is way down here and we're way up there. Now this is all, this is not kids, this is everybody. This includes Orlando, right? But I would argue that the shooting in Orlando is a, is a different form of cancer, okay? It's not what I see every day. That has to do with crazy people and automatic weapons. That's a whole other discussion. But think about this. You guys watched the TV coverage about Orlando, right? You saw those families in tears. Multiply the Orlando deaths. 49 people were murdered. Multiply that by 39. That's the number of kids who die every year. So think of all those families torn apart. Think of the tragedy. Think of all the families whose lives are ruined. That's what we face every single year. So what are we going to do about this? If it's, a, if it's a disease, if we can think of it as a disease, we might be opportunities to intervene. There might be opportunities to make this better. So first thing we got to do is got to get some data, right? Where is the disease prevalent in Columbus? Do you know? Is this neighborhood? A place where a lot of kids get shot? Well, it turns out, I do know the answer to that. This is what they call a heat map. This is the Columbus Fire Department. They made this map for me, okay? This is two years of EMS runs for pediatric firearm injury. You have to be aged less than 18, and they had to pick you up for being shot and brought for healthcare. And, and those places on the map, they call those hot spots. This is a heat map. Where are the hot spots? Office 71 up there, that's Linden, right? 
Down by the, they, they nicely put my place of employment in there. That's a hot spot, near east side. A little hot spot on the west side. Then there's a hot spot a little further east. Where's that? Right here, right? And in between those two places, there's a little white area. It's called Bexley, right? A white area called Bexley. <laughs> I promised I wasn't going to do that joke. No, anyways, so, um, but it's important. Kids don't get shot in Bexley. Kids do not get shot in Upper Arlington, right? Nobody gets shot in New Albany. It's against the law up there. So, but this is important because you have to know where to go. You have to look at the heat map. This is critically important. And I can tell you two important things you have to know. If you go through these zip codes and you go look at the census tracts on the US Census website and you look at what the mean income of each census tract is, I promise you there's a one-to-one -one correlation between poverty and pediatric firearm deaths. The poorer the census tract, the more likely kids are to get shot. I know it. I've done the research, or well, I actually made one of my residents do it, but it's true, OK? The other thing you have to know is that if you did a map of something like sleep deaths, like you know, unsafe sleeping, you know, kids, infants who die, you know, the ABC always, I can't even remember, my kids are in their 20s now, but it's the same map. These are the same areas where kids die from sleep, sleep deaths, exactly the same. Why? Because they're both diseases of poverty. Firearm trauma is a disease of poverty, and sleep deaths are a disease of poverty. Let me tell you something else I learned from some research, again, my poor residents and students. Who shoots the kids? No, oh, it's strangers, right? These are drive-by shootings, right? Kids out in the streets, not true. When we looked at the data, and it was a little while ago, and again, most of the kids that come to my place are under 16, so it's not a lot of the gang violence, but 50% of the kids were shot in their own home, 20% were shot in somebody else's home. I only have one kid. I've been working now over at Nationwide Children's since 1991. I've seen one kid shot at school, one. And he survived, by the way. Schools are safe. Why are schools safe? Adult supervision, meals, protected. When do we see the most firearm violence? 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock, out of school till bedtime, right? That's when kids get shot. The other thing we looked at, so who's the perpetrator? When we could find out the perpetrator, the majority of the time, the kid knew who shot them. Within that little pie, the most common perpetrator was a relative. Within that pie, the most common relative was a brother. So if you live in one of these neighborhoods, you have a gun in the home, and you got a brother, it's going to be a problem. So, and that's just kind of, kind of the way it is. So what, what can we do to improve the situation? What can we do? And, and I don't have any easy answers. Like I'm a surgeon. Things are pretty simple, right? Surgery textbook has lots of pictures in it. So, but I do think there are opportunities to intervene on a community level. You know, when there was like a polio epidemic in this country, they went to every household and made sure people were immunized. We need to go to these areas. You know, we don't need people in Upper Arlington or New Albany telling us what we should and shouldn't do. These are where the problems are. And what do we need to do? I mean, I, many people own guns for security. They want to feel safer in their homes. They live in high crime neighborhoods. But actually, if you look at the data and the statistics, it's really hard to prove that a gun makes a home safer. I mean, if you believe in science, which I think I do, and peer-reviewed medical journals, bringing a gun into the home actually increases the risk that a child will die, markedly increases the risk of suicide. Age 15 to 19, suicide is one of the most common causes of death. Many are by firearms. There's two statistics you need to know about suicide, 90 and 90. 90% 90 of people who attempt suicide with a firearm succeed. They kill themselves, like my orthodontist. 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt won't die from suicide. Most people, it's a once and done. If they survive, they will not die from suicide. Overall, having a handgun in your house makes it less safe. The odds of shooting a bad guy, protecting your home, is less than the odds of harming someone. But to get that message across, you probably need to meet with people, talk to them, do an intervention, go to these communities. That's what needs to be done. And the overall context of this is this is a disease, and we need to approach it as a public health intervention. I'm done with talking to legislators. I've been there. I went and talked to Ohio State House. It's like talking to a bunch of bricks. I mean, when you go talk to the legislators, they hold up their newspapers. Well, now they hold up their iPads. 
and totally ignore you. So that is not going to solve the problem. We need community-based intervention. And what's in it for me? I've taken care of too many Joeys. I've taken care of, I've had too many of those long walks down the hallway, and I'd like to be able to retire in a couple of years without taking care of another fatal gunshot injury. Thank you. <laughs>